Okay, so we're now at lesson two, three, and you can see the title of my lesson. It's really two priorities that we're going to major on in this lesson. We're going to talk about the extrema, if it exists, for a particular graph. How do we know? How can we tell that there are extremes, extreme points? And then we're going to begin the lesson by learning how to describe the end behavior a particular graph. So let's just jump right into that because that's what your assignment is going to ask you to do. They're going to provide some graphs for you and they want you to do a description of the end behavior. And so what we mean by that is how do we describe where this graph is going on the right end or the right side and how do we describe where it's headed on the left. And here's how we do that. It's really if you think about traveling first along the x-axis, that's, that's where you start the description. So let me give you an example of how your answer will look for a problem like letter A. Okay, as I travel in the positive direction on the x-axis, or in other words, I'm going to say as x approaches positive infinity, Okay, so it begins there with the description of how do I travel horizontally along the X. Do you notice that as I travel in that direction, the Y value is going down. And using infinity, we would say down is negative infinity. Okay, so to follow up this statement, as I approach positive infinity going along the X axis, the graph, or f of x, is approaching negative infinity. So that would take care of a description of the right end. And now don't forget, you also need to do a description of what's happening as we go to the left. So it always begins with how you're traveling along the x-axis as x approaches negative infinity. The graph or the y values, or y, f of x are synonymous, f of x is headed toward positive <clears throat> infinity. It's traveling up forever and ever according to that arrow. So that's an example of how we do end behavior. And these are linear functions. In just a minute, we'll do the same thing with nonlinear functions. Okay, so uh, let's try letter B. Letter B is a little different. We start off the same way. If we want to look at, analyze the right end. So the way I do that, I start traveling along the x-axis in a positive direction. As x approaches positive infinity, do you notice that the function the function f of x never changes. It's always the same number. That's just the line, we would say it's the line y equals 6. y is always 6 on this line, no matter what the x value is. So in this case, I'm actually going to have a constant. f of x always stays 6 as I travel to the right <coughs> forever or as I approach positive infinity. And then we'll do the same thing going to the left. As x approaches negative infinity, the same thing is true. This is called a constant function. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, so you get a little idea of how we do these descriptions of end behavior. So now let's do the same thing. Only difference is these are nonlinear functions. All right, so I'm going to take letter A, and I always begin by traveling toward positive infinity on the x-axis. So I'm just going to state it like this. As x approaches positive infinity, where is f of x going? Or in other words, I'm analyzing this right end. Where is it headed as I approach positive infinity on the x? Where does that arrow indicate? Uh, up or down? And I'm going up forever, right? So how do I indicate 
up forever. Okay, f of x, which is another way of saying the function, or it's another way of saying the y values, are also approaching positive infinity. <clears throat> and now let's do the left end. All right, so this time as we travel along the x-axis toward negative infinity, or as x approaches negative infinity, what's the graph doing on the left end? It's still going up forever. f of x is still approaching positive infinity, just like it did when we were approaching positive infinity on the x. OK? <clears throat> Any questions so far? Anybody want to volunteer for letter B? Any brave souls? Carly? Carly, what about it? As x goes to positive infinity, the f of x also goes to positive Also, that's correct. As you can tell, we're always going, as we go right, we're always going up. Okay, now do the left end. Very good. As we travel to the left, horizontally, the left end of this graph is going down forever, which is another way of saying negative infinity. Good. Give me somebody else for letter C. Katie? Good. There's the right side. Very good. Good job. Think you got it? Any questions? Everybody good? Any questions at all? All right. So let's change gears. Uh, new topic. Let's talk about, first of all, because your assignment's going to ask you to find what are known as zeros of a function. And just in case you don't know what that means, you can't find zeros unless you know what they're referring to. So I just provided with, uh, you with a little definition here. Uh, zeros of a function are the inputs, because there could be one, there could be several. But all of the inputs that make the function equal zero, that's what a zero of a function is. You may also recognize them as the solution. Or we could say solutions, because there may be more than one. Or you might recognize them. These terms are used synonymously. Uh, they're also known as x-intercepts. So let me do a quick little example using this function that I provided for you here, if we're asked to find the zeros of this function, and um, if, if they are zeros of a function, then there should be numbers that we could plug in for x to cause this function to equal zero. So for that reason, I'm going to set this up so that it does equal zero. I'm just going to make it an equation equal to zero. This is a quadratic equation. Um, fortunately, it factors, so since factoring is possible, factoring is the easiest way to solve quadratics. You could also use quadratic formula or completing the square. We'll cover all of those later. But do you remember how this factors? Remember this? What are the factors of negative 6 that add up to positive 1? Positive 3 and negative 2. And since we've done the factoring, that makes it very easy to see the solutions. There are two of them. I knew that because the degree of the polynomial is 2. So I should have two solutions. 
So that's great. Maybe uh, in Algebra 1, maybe in geometry, you solved some quadratics like that. You cranked out the solutions. Well, here's what that means as far as the graph is concerned. This graph has to cross the x-intercept at negative 3 and at positive 2. And right in between those two, well, you tell me. We've talked about this a little bit since this is a parabola. It has a line called the line of symmetry, and it should go right in between those two points. And we're not going to take the graph, this whole thing. My point here is when you're asked to find the zeros of a function, you're essentially solving a, an equation that equals zero. And I want you to make the connection that those solutions also represent x-intercepts for the graph. Okay? So with that said, <clears throat> let's just talk about occasions like this because your book will give you some problems that look like this. They'll provide you with a table of values and they'll provide you with a graph that is represented or represents this table and they want you to find the zeros. Well, one of these zeros, my graph isn't great because I missed that point just a little bit, but you can see over here, one of my zeros is pretty obvious. If I let x be negative 1 in this function, I get 0. So that means x equals negative 1 is one of my zeros. But the other two aren't quite so obvious because I can't tell just by looking at the graph where that is. And I can't tell by looking at the graph where this is. So I know that it's pretty close to positive 1. Okay. So in cases like this, uh, like I've said here, sometimes we have to estimate. We can't tell by the table. I can tell there is a 0 because if you notice, I went from uh, a negative number output here, because I'm in 2, so that's 0, negative 2. I crossed over from a negative output to a positive. So that indicates that there is a 0 in there somewhere. And we already saw that. So you could do this one of two ways. You could say that my 0 is between x equals 0 and x equals 1. But in cases like this, where it looks like it's nearer to one or the other, I'm going to say that we have a 0 near x equals 1. So if you were doing a problem like this for homework, there's two ways to notice zeros. If all you had to go on was this table, then you're looking for output values that change from negative to positive or vice versa. <clears throat> that will indicate that we crossed over the x-axis in between those two values for x. Okay, and then we've got another zero that we'll have to approximate. So it, you could say either between x equals 3 and x equals 4, but it looks like it's closer to x equals 4, so I'm going to say near x equals 4. Okay, so any questions about how we know exactly where zeros are and then times where we'll have to approximate them? And it's, it should be pretty easy looking at the graph uh, how to approximate. And if you came in Monday and you said it's between uh, x equals 3 and x equals 4, I'm not going to count that wrong. But if, if it is obviously closer to one versus the other, then just state the one that it's nearest. Any questions so far? So a zero for a function is another way of saying an x-intercept. Okay, now let's go to maxima and minima. <clears throat> so here's the thing that you need to think about when you're looking for relative maxima. I use the word relative because there will come a time in pre-calculus calculus where you'll find absolute maxima and minima. And we're going to save that discussion for later. Relative maxima and minima are typically pretty close to the origin. And when you're looking for them, you're thinking turning points. Another way of thinking about maximum or minimum points is think about where the graph 
turns or changes direction from up to down, like we did right here, or from down to up. So I went ahead and labeled three different points that represent relative maxima or minima, or in other words, we have three turning points for this graph. So let's talk about letter A. Letter A would be considered a relative maximum. Maxima is the plural form. Okay, can we tell exactly for the value of x where that point is? I mean, is it pretty obvious? And I don't really even know which one it's closer to. So to state this, where this relative maximum is, we always state it in relation to the x value. I'm going to say that there's a relative maximum between And what are those two x values? x equals negative 1 and x equals negative 2. If you came in Monday and you said, I think it's near x equals negative 1, that's OK. Uh, you can really state these in two different ways, and they're both fine. I just can't really tell by my graph. So since it looks like it's splitting the difference, I'm just going to say it's between. Okay, moving on to letter B. I'll go ahead and take the time to change my color. Letter B represents a relative minimum because I've changed direction. I was going down, I hit this point, and now I'm starting back up. Some people refer to these as peaks and valleys. So letter B, I'm going to call this a relative minimum. Can you tell, based on our graph, here's my origin, uh, where that relative minimum occurs for what x value? OK. Um, yeah, here's the origin. So I'm right on the y-axis. So I, I have a relative minimum at. I don't have to say near. I don't have to say between. It's at x equals 0. Okay, now we move on to letter C. Notice I've changed direction again. I've gone from up to down. And so in calculus, pre-calculus, you'll call these inflection points. Or relative maximum, again, I've changed direction. So letter C represents a relative maximum. Notice I've got two of them. And how would you state where this relative maximum occurs? Would you say near 0, x equals 0, near x equals 1? I think it's pretty close to x equals 1, so I'm going to say near x equals 1. Any questions on that slide? How to tell if you have relative maximum or minimum? Um, just as a heads up, not all graphs have extrema. Notice this graph, which just happens to be the cube root function, x minus 2. You'll do this later. Do you see any points where I'm changing direction from up to down or down to up? I mean, I see a change in the curve, but uh, a relative maximum or minimum literally means I'm moving up, I hit a point, and then I come back down. Or I'm going down, I hit a point, and I go back up. Those are what maximum, minimum, those are inflection points, turning points. But actually, I'm not really turning direction here. I'm just following that same path, gradually going upward, and I never really change direction. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. I don't want you to be tricked. Uh, one of your problems will, I think it's one of those, one student said this, another student said this, who's right? And just wanted to prepare you for that problem. OK, so we're almost done. You guys are doing great. Um, this didn't copy as well as I'd hoped, but I'll see if I can get some help from you. Uh, the table and the graph go together. OK, this graph is just plotting these points and drawing the curve. Um, we're supposed to, first of all, estimate the zeros. So probably easier to read, hopefully, on your 
panned out. So here's the origin. This is negative 1, negative 2. Um, what would you say on letter A, um, Matthew, do we have a 0 of this function? And where is it? OK, and how would you describe it? OK, and if you did that, that would be fine. Uh, how's another way we could describe it? Since it, it looks like it's really, really close to the origin. Yeah. Yeah, we could also say near. But what Matthew said is, is fine. Your book actually does it in both ways. I typically like to be a little more exact. If it's closer to one point than the other, I'm going to say near. If I can't really tell, I'll say between. All right, so we've taken care of the zero. There's only one. Uh, do we have any um, relative maxima? Let's start there. Let's say, do we have a relative maximum point? Johnny, you say yes? Where does it occur? And if you can't tell exactly, we can still say near. OK. And, yeah, I'm going to say near. He's identifying this point right here, in case you didn't know. It's going to be near x equals uh, negative 2. All right, do we have a relative minimum? Cooper, what do you think? OK, we have one near. Because I can't really tell for sure, based on this fuzzy graph, near x equals negative 1. All right, very good. Uh, Reagan, what about letter B? What about zeros? Good. Lakin, do we have a relative maximum? Uh, maximum, you, I guess, are you looking at that point? So that's pretty close to, again, you're looking at the x value. So it's, I know it's probably not easy to see, but what's the x value for that point? Or what's it pretty close to? All right. Near x equals 0. Is that what you said? Did you say 0? OK. I, I just wanted to make sure I didn't hear you wrong. OK, so uh, what about a relative minimum gauge? Um, near, one. near x equals 1. Very good. OK, I want you to try these two on your own. Find any zeros, any relative maximum and minimum. So we're going to have to approximate, obviously, because this is the table. And do you notice that none of these y values are actually 0? So that tells us we're going to have to do an approximation. If, if they are 0 exactly, then we can say it's at this number. But none of these x inputs produce a 0, actual 0 output. So we're going to have to approximate in each case. <coughs> uh, Sydney, uh, where are our zeros? <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'll throw it to somebody else. Um, Lauren. Um, I put near x equals negative 2. Okay. Near x equals 2. Very good. Uh, Matthew, what about uh, relative maximum? Zero. Okay. We're going to say near 0. And 
And what about relative minimum? Okay, pretty close to negative one and I should say x equals, sorry about that. Well, uh, maximum uh, has to occur when we're changing direction from down to up. So that point right there represents a relative maximum. And these other two are the minimum. Is that what you're asking? No, but like when you're counting like, like the points at where it changes, are you counting the y-axis or the x-axis? You're saying to get these, you're looking at the x. Okay, real fast. Um, Reagan, what about the zeros for letter D? Um, near x okay, and okay, okay, okay. All right. And then um, the reason why we're approximating on these is because we don't know for sure if we could get a little bit lower by choosing inputs that are decimals. So it's okay to do approximations. What about the relative max uh, gauge? Um, x is smaller than y, so that's going to be negative one. Okay. And then we should have two relative minimums. Uh, X is negative 2 and positive 2. All right. What do you think? Any questions? Okay. I think I gave you the slide that has the assignment on it. So if you have any questions over the weekend, feel free to let me know. Shoot me an email.